that's really the core profit of the Adani group. And they have been continuously multiplying and scaling up this model. It's a simple arbitrage business. Every time in India, infrastructure is built by anybody, it's been a high interest rate scenario. Uh, as I said, that this is the best time for banks and NBFCs, the best time that I've seen them. So we're here shooting our third Paisa Smart podcast. All excited, Varun. Yeah. So why don't we start by talking about, you know, what's happened since the last podcast in the markets? You know, any major news flow? Where have the markets gone? Yeah, we live in interesting times. We had a super budget, which we discussed in the last, last podcast. But I think the budget has uh, taken the back seat, and it is now all, up, all over the papers. It's all about the Adani Group and the Hindenburg Report. And uh, it's really what has been hogging the limelight and mind space. So let's talk about that today. Why not? We can give a proper perspective, balanced opinion on uh, what has impacted the Irani group of companies, a little bit about their history and uh, the road forward for them. I mean, for me, what I'd love to understand is how exactly they make money. Because, you know, over the last year, two years, three years, they've had an incredible rise, you know, and particularly in the last year, Gautam Adani has been everywhere and uh, I think even recently off post budget they had their FTO which they pulled uh, so let's why don't we trace that whole journey and you know start at the start of the beginning and let's understand where Gautam Adani's come from how Adani's you know grown uh, so yeah I mean why don't so, we start with the flagship you know, yeah so basically India has a shortage of coal and we're always importing coal and that's where Adani, a uh, very shrewd industrialist, he started importing coal into India and became one of the largest uh, coal importer, supplying to all the power plants. And that was his first uh, sort of uh, rise to fame over there. And thereafter, he knew to import coal, read a port. So he proceeded to build a port at Mundra. I've gone over there, by the way. It's a fantastic uh, piece of infrastructure. Um, solid performing asset and so once he built the port uh, the idea behind the port was to make it like a SEZ so he would invite other industries to come over there and they could easily export out of the port and to provide power to those industries he set up a power plant over there just see how uh, shrewd and how intelligent he has planned every move of his so coal for coal need the port Port will not work by itself. It needs a SEZ. So, so the SEZ. So fully integrated yeah. business across. Backward and forward linkages. Yes. Yeah. So they're, uh, I mean, they, they position themselves in an infrastructure and utility business. That's right. And that's where the port comes in and, you know, the associated logistics and the Mundra SEZ and then the power, power business. And once you got into power, all the facets of power, transmission, distribution, and then the future of power is in green. So therefore, he started Adani Green, which is into renewable power sources. And now going into road projects, acquired a few airports as well. So their thought process is very clear that they like to uh, buy, if they can, good infrastructure project, which is already having solid cash flows. Or if they are building an infrastructure project, they will make sure that it is done within the time period and within the cost. So execution focused. Exactly. Okay. Low cost execution and as soon as possible starts to generate cash flow. So why don't we go, I guess, company by company a little bit just to understand, you know, how their sort of overall, the overall Adani empire, how it fits together. Yeah. And then maybe we can also discuss, you know, some of the Hindenburg's allegations and and what it is that they spoke about, what it is that they identified within the Adani group that they don't like. And also maybe the market impact. There's, there's a lot of moving yeah, pieces to this. Yeah, no, this is a tough topic. <laughs> yeah. So let's but start with what, So Adani was the incubator company as we were yeah. speaking. And uh, I think one of the best things they've done for their minority shareholders is that they never really diluted capital. Adani Enterprises would incubate a business and then they would spin it off and have a mirror image of Adani Enterprise in the new company. And therefore, a lot of the shareholders of Adani got free shares of all the other listed companies, be it transmission, power, green, 
total total gas so that was a very innovative structure of growing a business i think it's never been attempted by anybody in india as far as i know so it's almost like a, a publicly listed venture capital fund yes uh, and exclusive to the infrastructure space and then once the infra- once the infrastructure project becomes uh, profitable and scalable then if you are holder of that venture capital uh, sh- uh, fund it just gives you directly the shares of that particular venture quite a innovative strategy yeah so they have ports which handles the mundra port and it's acquired several other ports as well as the gangadharam port then it's the power plant which is the traditional power plant coal based gas based power plants transmission which has uh, high and low transmission uh, lines and then of course you know total gas which is uh, gas distribution okay so why don't we dig into ports specifically because that's i guess one of the more performing assets um of all the adani group companies it's performed the best since the hindenburg report came out so so to speak i think uh, on average most of them have fallen by 50 60% but ports has just fallen by by 23% and uh, the promoter holding that was pledged was 7 17.3% but i know that recently they repaid 1.1 billion dollars relatively early and it is lot of the pledges as well yeah yeah So, the port uh, Adani Ports and SEZ is it just you know the flagship Mundra uh, terminal or is there a lot? I mean, presumably there's a lot more there. Yeah, there there are many other ports as well, and and it's their um, it's their endeavor to uh, you know have as many ports and get the synergy benefits out of it, and they know the business very well, and the reason why I think port hasn't fallen is because it's reasonably valued. Uh, all the other listed entities were at very high valuations, and I think that's the primary reason why the stock prices fell as well. So, and the valuation came into focus once the Hindenburg report came to light, because I think that they immediately compared the PE multiple, the price to earnings multiple, of the Adani Group companies with other comparable businesses. and if a comparable business was going at a pe multiple of 15 to 20 times or so a similar business in the adani group was going at many hundred times yeah i think of all you know uh, i look at adani enterprise which is at 172 yeah. transmission that is after the fall yeah that, this is our post fall pe yeah that's right adani transmission is 120 you just double it and you come to what it was at uh, the peak yeah but adani was a comparatively 25 it's not bad i not mean, bad at all yeah, yeah. and it's an operating port uh, cash flow generating and strategic ports as well so that's where uh, and same with power as well but you know power nobody is really uh, very keen to invest because of esg related issues as well yeah. so i mean why don't we detail for the viewers what exactly adani power holds i think uh, it's got largely coal based thermal power you know going back to that coal trading linkage that uh, yes. the original adani enterprises had but also a few of them have been purchased outright by them at very attractive valuations as well yeah. so i think the majority in fact of their uh, installed thermal power capacity was purchased they've got gujarat which is presumably they built themselves <coughs> maharashtra karnataka rajasthan mp and chatisgarh of which <coughs> they acquired the chatisgarh plant they acquired the karnataka plant and they acquired the madhya pradesh plant as yeah, well but that's the strategy of the group that either they will acquire running assets or if they are building an asset or infrastructure project they will make sure it's done in uh, the right time as at well the right cost so execution focus on execution over there yeah. and the thing about infrastructure projects in india is varun that they are all regulated by the government in some form or the other so you can clearly define what your cash flows can be if the infrastructure project is running <clears throat> and if it is operating at optimal capacity then you can predict long term cash flows see but if that's true then why is adani the only one that's been successful in doing this <clears throat> because execution one there were others like gvk gmr anil ambani reliance group which were not successful in the infrastructure space because they their main focus was to start building a infrastructure project which has a long gestation period 
and they were financing it with very heavy debt at high interest rates. That is why the projects became unviable because there were delays over there, cost overruns over there, and that was just not sustainable. And in so, fact, I think a lot of the Adani's assets that they've purchased, they've purchased from these GVR, GMR. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the airports, I think. They've all bought distressed assets, yeah. per se. Yeah. And you know how they funded it? It's really interesting. It's never been, I mean, it's been done in India, but not at a scale that the Adani's have done it. So over the years, and then their CFO has done a fabulous job. Over the years, they have pursued and they have uh, presented themselves to large long-term debt investors. So their model is simple. You have an infrastructure project which can give you a 15% thereabout type of a yield on the asset and it has to be financed by a loan obviously. They've taken international borrowing for that and that cost of loan may be anywhere from 6% to 7-8% including hedging costs 10-11%. So you have a 4 5% spread in between on a large asset, large base. And that's really the core profit of the Adani group. And they have been continuously multiplying and scaling up this model. It's a simple arbitrage business where you are borrowing cheap into infra project, which is, which is generating steady cash flows to you. I think I'm looking at some numbers as well. And then overall, the amount of debt that they raised from PSUs in particular, is is much much lower than 2016 i think it's 55 percent of borrowings has come down sharp they sharp did not make the mistake others made yeah because when you borrow from psu banks and if you're unable to pay then there are a lot of covenants which come into play and there's immediate stress on the borrower over here so they specifically went to long-term patient debt market investors and uh, uh, they kind of you know presented themselves uh, they they uh, went through all the criteria, got themselves uh, se- uh, eligible to receive loans from or ish- or uh, receive them as investors in their uh, debt uh, debt securities. But I mean, isn't that inherently got a lot of risk? And I'll I'll outline sort of where my thinking is coming from, right? So they've raised a lot of this money over the last five seven years, whatever, and. Over the last five, seven years, pandemic time in particular, interest rates globally were rock bottom. Yeah, you're right about that. And, and that now, also helped them. Yeah. And actually speaking, it's a very interesting point you made, Varun. Because every time in India, infrastructure is built by anybody, it's been a high interest rate scenario uh, period. They have built or acquired assets when the overall interest rates in India as well as globally were at record lows. Yeah. So that, that kind of tailwind helped them certainly a lot. Now obviously that's changing, right? Yeah. And and I mean, okay, interest rates were low, but also energy costs were low. And because of that, India's currency was more stable. We yes. go into a higher energy cost environment, higher inflation, faster depreciating currency, yeah. higher interest rates, all those tailwinds that sort of Help hey. Adani grow. Uh, all turning around, yeah. So I think that's not his problem. His problem right now is Hindenburg. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, because uh, everybody knew about these things. Uh, but the Hindenburg report, uh, what it has brought into spotlight is A, the valuations, B, the excessive debt on the balance sheet, and the fact that there are uh, there have been investigations against the company in the past. They have been associated with uh, individuals who also have been investigated. That's broadly what Hindenburg is trying to say over there. I think one of the other things that they pointed out was the opaque shareholding, particularly the opaque foreign shareholding. That's right. That's been a that's been a really a concern with many investors, not just Hindenburg. There's nothing new in the market. Last almost four or five years, this has been a question uh, which has been asked to the management. And they, of course, have uh, responded to it appropriately. But uh, this is something, you know, which uh, has caused a bit of a, of a, I would say, issue uh, f- from the investor's perspective. And I would say that maybe that's one of the reasons why they do not have that much of a dispersed shareholding pattern. If you look at the top shareholders, apart from LIC, there are no known names, no HNIs, uh, no marquee investors, no large pension funds, FIIs. Now, ironically, too much debt, not a dispersed shareholding. Both of these problems have been fixed with the FPO. 
if you think about it, they would have got external capital in to sort of reduce that debt burden, diversify the shareholding. And it's all gone now. Yeah, that, that was the objective of the FPO as well. But anyway, now that's the past. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, let's talk about something else, you know, which comes to mind. Is that how much the traders have profited from Adani? See, Adani is one group which has been continuously in the news with a lot of positive news flow coming every now and then. And that has, of course, uh, attracted a whole host of traders into the Adani stocks. And uh, in any case, the, the shareholding pattern was very tight and concentrated. They themselves own 75%. And then these couple of FIIs, I think they own 10, 15%. I'm not sure how much. <clears throat> so the actual floating stock is very little in the market. And many traders uh, have started buying into it. And when it comes to trading, once the stock is on a roll, it only attracts many more traders on the long side. And that's why we find that the stock price has been going up more on trading volumes and trading, uh, hold, traded holdings rather than actual investments. Now, what is the positive fallout of this, you know, is that the sharp fall in Adani Group stocks are not really affected investors' portfolios or mutual fund yeah, NAVs. There's no substantial mutual fund holding for any Adani, exactly. Adani company. That's because, you know, all of us professional investors have always... Uh, rather have lately avoided infrastructure companies having lost our uh, fingers with uh, the likes of GVR and uh, GMR and GVK and Reliance uh, ADAG group companies. So therefore, infrastructure was never really a space that investors wanted to invest in, which is why I think Adani never got that, that kind of, a, uh, I would say, preference from local mutual funds or even some of the large uh, Mark EFIS. <clears throat> so I guess what's the future here, right? Because there's, I mean, the money that was going to, you know, <clears throat> go out of the company seems to have slowly leaked out. Uh, that, that trading volume that, that you were talking about, it doesn't seem likely that, you know, momentum traders are going to pile back into the company. No, in fact, so. it's hitting them the other way around. Because the same traders are selling with great deal of vigor. And they want to try and exit the counter. And uh, the, there is just no one there in the market, uh, deep pocket to buy. What I'm surprised is that they had the FPO, which was completely, uh, I would say, uh, subscribed. Why don't the investors who are invested in the FPO buy in the secondary market? Is it an interesting question? Yeah, to maybe ask. they're waiting for it to fall further, you know. Okay, I mean, you can keep on waiting, <laughs> but there's never the right time. You can never know when the right time it is. But uh, I think that's the reason uh, that the prices are still falling, uh, because it's the traders who are really actually trying to exit the counters over there. So as an investor, though, someone that's holding cash, would you consider holding on to any of the company? Is that something you know you would recommend? Is that something we want to be doing? Or... Still some distance to go. See, Varun, normally <clears throat> you like to invest in companies where there are least controversies, uh, where uh, valuations are reasonable, and where there is certain degree of status quo. What is happening over here is that every day there is some news flow or the other happening, negative, positive, whatever it may be. For example, now a lot of the rating agencies have put Adani uh, debt on watch, maybe even downgraded. MSCI is saying that they will cut the weightages. Yeah, yeah. Who knows what's going to happen next? There are a uh, lot of demand for JPC by the opposition party. Uh, regulators are being asked the question that what are you doing about it? So if they start investigating, if something comes out of there. <clears throat> so it's a, there are too many moving parts and there's just uh, too many uncertainties. So keeping all of that in mind, I would say that it's better to stay away for some time. Let the dust settle down. Let this, uh, let, let uh, whatever, uh, you know, actions are to be taken, let the, those be over and done with. Then you can reassess the business uh, and look at investing in the Adani Group company, but not right now. I don't think so. You think it will affect India, I mean, at all? Because they're obviously a major infrastructure builder and a lot of India's, <clears throat> core infrastructure is, is in their hands. I mean, you're talking about seven major airports, 25% uh, of our port capacity, 
substantial chunk of thermal power generation. Yeah, very interesting point you made, Varun Ovaya. Because uh, this government wants to build out infrastructure really fast and we desperately need good quality and infrastructure. And they want to better infrastructure <coughs> executors. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> but my real concern is that post this hidden work incident, if they are unable to raise resources for their ongoing projects or even for new ventures, then that's not good news from India's perspective because we need many more Adanis to build the infrastructure in India. And they had got the formula right, which many hadn't. And if because of this particular development, they are unable to raise uh, funds globally in India at attractive uh, interest rates, then certainly I think their growth momentum may become a bit slow. And that also is a point to consider when you're making an investment because when you were earlier contemplating an investment, you were looking at these companies growing at a good, good space. But now I think if they're going to struggle for capital, then you need to... That good. I mean, if you're an arbitrage, right, you're buying nearly completed assets, you're doing assets, if you're you know, constructing physical assets, and you're not able to finance that arbitrage with fresh, fresh capital, that growth is just not going to be exactly. there. Exactly, that's the real issue over there. Yeah. But uh, let's, uh, let's see how, how it uh, actually plays out. But there's no denying the fact that um, there is uh, some, some damage, uh, I think, uh, to the uh, Indian equity cult per se, because it has brought into focus uh, certain practices in India. And it also had an impact on the PSU banks as well, you know, Varun, because uh, the banks had lent to the Adani group and then there were uh, at least the street feared that if what if there was a default which I think is highly unlikely and I'll tell you why because the PSU banks have lent to specific projects and most of them have escrow accounts so where they have the first right on the on the cash inflow which comes in but you know the street is just has its own imagination and therefore while this was happening the not only the Adani stock Corrected, but it had a lot of uh, collateral damage the on the uh, PSC stocks. stocks. Yeah, I think uh, it was a relatively positive budget in PSC stocks are corrected. And mind you, PSUs came with good set of numbers as well yeah, in the yeah. selling season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyways, before we <coughs> jump on the, the PSC stocks and I guess the earnings of financials, because I think the other big subject has been the earnings season, do we think, let's let's take the assumption that Adani is, you know, it's a it's a speed bump. There's a bit of a growth slowdown. They're not able to raise fresh capital. They're not able to launch new projects. Is there anyone that stands to benefit? You know, do you think there's someone that will step into the fray? Because obviously there's a demand for infrastructure in India, right? I mean, you still need more power plants. You still need more transmission lines. You still need more ports. Still a fundamentally structurally growing economy. Is there anyone that's poised to benefit? Yeah, I think there are a lot of ambitious industrialists uh, in India. And there's, uh, there are many innovative uh, financial structures also available. Uh, there are these investment trusts, infrastructure investment trusts also there. Uh, government itself is looking at privatizing. And we spoke about in the budget as well, the capital expenditure going up yeah. by 37%. So the government themselves is very keen on uh, building infrastructure by itself from its own resources. So yes, I think that uh, if... Adani Group were to slow down, it would be a minor setback for the infrastructure route in India. But there are many others who will come into and fill their shoes. I think that's much of a much of a concern. Okay. Person. No. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, let's move on to the other segment that we wanted to talk about. I guess financial services companies and their results. Yeah. So, uh, as I said, that. This is the best time for banks and NBFCs, the best time that I've seen them. Uh, so typically, the economy has started doing much better. The demand for credit is robust post the, the pandemic and the uh, lockdowns. So demand is good for credit. And at the same time, uh, the NPAs are at decade low levels, decades low. You haven't he's seen such low NPAs in the banking industry in a very long time. So on one hand, you have the income coming in uh, strongly for these for the banking companies and the NBFCs, and the major cost, that being the uh, provisions for bad loans, 
those are subdued. In fact, they are writing back a lot of the loans they had written off earlier through, through good recovery practices. And you know, there's, I think there's a lot more dry powder in the system as well. Because I was reading recently, I think, uh, strong retail flows to mutual funds. But uh, su- surprisingly, there's outflows from debt in liquid mutual funds as consumers are shifting to lock their money into FTs at these sky high rates. Yeah, that's why I think there's a, there's a war going on for deposits because banks need these deposits to lend and there's good demand coming from uh, retail, uh, retails, from household, from, from even companies because the CAPEX cycle itself is picking up. So I think that uh, it's a great time for banks and we've seen all the results to come from the prior sector banks from the PSU banks and on the NBSEs as well. I think they are all reporting record profits over here. So before I dig into that, I have a question here because I saw something today that confused me. Um, in a high interest rate environment, you know, expecting banks to do well, it's credit demand, low NPAs, like you said, a number of different tables. But still, I think over the last two months, FPIs and FIIs have, have sold a lot in the financial sector. Now, is this just profit taking? Is this expensive valuations? Are we missing something here? What's what's going on there? I think FIs are generally selling and they, the selling has intensified since China has opened up. Yeah. So the thing is that whatever incremental cash was coming into emerging markets or existing emerging market investors also, they are trying to reduce their weightage into India and increase into China. But I think this is an aberration. It's a short-term process because China uh, was uh, really the market had gone nowhere for the last two, three years in, during COVID. And now because the, they have opened up their economy, we should, they should see good earnings next two, three quarters. So there is some, I think, opportunistic capital moving away from India into China. Yeah, but you know, I, I, think that, uh, <clears throat> I think that that might end up reversing. I don't know if you saw recently, but there was this whole uh, hoopla about this spy balloon. Yeah. So, and every time one of these things happen, you know, there's there's a you know fresh wave of geopolitical tensions. There's more sanctions, more, more interference by the U.S. and generally the Western bloc. And you know that just makes China's life a little harder. It makes capital movement between you know the West and China a little harder. So, all that all, all that capital has been reorienting from India to China. I think that's you know probably going to stop or, or is going to come back the other way because. You know, with every passing month as geopolitical tensions ratchet up, I think people are going to reevaluate their positions in China more and more and more and more. But I'm not losing sleep over FIs pulling money out of India. You know why? <laughs> the FDIs have loads of cash to deploy. And who, who are DIs funded by? Us guys. Yeah. Retail investors. Retail investors. Hats off to them. I think um, this has really been the, the most positive development in the capital market. Of the last two three years, the absolute uh, faith of the retail investors into the Indian equity, and when the markets are correcting, they are keep increasing that, their SIP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that what SIP phenomena, culture. What a phenomenon! And yeah. you know what's, what occurs to me about what's going to happen is because you've got so many people, that particularly in the last year and year coming forth, they're just investing on SIP when valuations are compressing, when markets are correcting. They'll they all end up buying at the right time. Exactly. Just by like continuously investing. And you know, when markets rebound and sentiment rebounds, they'll enjoy that full bounce up. It'll be great. Absolutely. You know when the bounce will come? When the FIs start buying. Yeah. And you know what is happening over here, Varun? I've tried something very interesting. That FII is single, two, five, five FIs may have sold, let's say example, 10 lakh State Bank of India over the period of time. The entire 10 lakh State Bank of India has gone to retail investors. Yeah. 100, oh, no, Everything has got rebalanced by retail investors. Now, when they want to buy 10 lakh SBI, the retailer are going to sell 10 lakh to them back. They're all long-term investors. Yep. So they're going to come and they're going to push the prices up. And that's when retail investors will see a fabulous return on all the SIPs, which they have been so disciplined about in terms of... Uh, you know, continuously investing in the market. So I think that let's not worry too much about the FIIs. Oil prices also are now more or less under control. I only hope the war in Ukraine, something, I wonder what do you think is going to happen, Varun? Yeah, that's, see, you know, everyone, so 
Ukraine was very interesting. That 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 piece of land. So the Ukraine was really about Crimea and the land rich like Crimea. That's that's the core because. If you look at Russia, not just as it's in its current form, but as the USSR and before that Imperial Russia, their whole philosophy through the last two, three hundred years has been to expand until they hit a port. Because the great challenge that Russia has, if you think about it at you know at the extremes, is they have no warm water ports. Port. Yes. Which be means that. that if they have to if they have to trade, they can only trade seasonally. And the only warm water port that they that they ever managed to hit was Crimea. And in fact, the Russian fleet, the, the naval fleet, is uh, was housed historically in Sevastopol. And that's why Crimea is of extreme importance to them. And that's why that land bridge is also so important. Because Crimea, outside of that land bridge, is an island. There's, there's really only one bridge that connects it to the, the core Russian mainland. So they need that land bridge. So like some of the, you know, the, the big conflicts of this, this last century. All around that area. Yeah. You know, if you go back, there was first the Crimean War. Then in World War One they fought over it. In World War Two they fought over it. It's, it's one of those... That area but let's, will let's really, end. What do you think will then? It will never end. It is one of those evergreen conflicts that will always be there and it's every time one of these conflicts takes place it's a shock to the global economy there's a big issue there but eventually these the system sort of you know realigns if you think about you know back at the start of the war energy prices went through the roof nobody knew where europe was going to get gas from then they've managed to find gas they they, they, yeah. they shipped gas in and now their stores are at a historical highs and they buoyed by a favorable winter. So they resolved that problem. Oil went through the roof. How will you know the whole oil oil price cap work? How will the ban on you know uh, Western companies insuring Russian oil tankers work? That's also got resolved. Yeah, it's coming through India and China. Yeah. And really so it's yeah. it's gonna become one of these really those I hate to use the word, but evergreen conflicts. Yeah, that's look at the humanitarian cost over there. Really, uh, my heart goes out to the Ukrainians over there. There's just no peace coming to them. What we thought was going to be a short war is just a long drawn affair. There's never going to be a short war. There's never going to be a short war. Well, why do you say that, Varun? You have one, one side, you have Russia, which, which, is, which is the I would say second or third largest military force in the world against a poor military opponent. They that's, could have finished it off in a few weeks. That's a mirage. That's not really true at all. So there's this view of Russian military strength is entirely out of date because their their productive capacity is extremely low. So most of their quote unquote military strength is historical production capacity. It's, it's legacy equipment from the Soviet Union. And on the other side, on the Ukrainian side, don't just look at Ukraine because everybody's supporting, supporting them. Yeah. Basically. So you've got this the entire industrial machinery of uh, of the west that's supplying weapons and armaments and arms and ammunitions to ukraine on the other side you have the russians really struggling to produce arms and armaments so that's why it's it's stuck and you also you have to look a little bit at the geography of it most of the front is is covered by a river so making making any incursion across a river is difficult the areas where ukraine made gains were the open plains now, we'll see if they're able to continue making gains there, but after the Russians have mobilized fresh troops I, I, and they've dug themselves in now, I would, I would say it's very unlikely. I hope it ends quickly, you know, because it's having a great impact on interest rates. Our, our MPCA raised interest rates by a quarter percentage again. Yeah, but you know, it's, I was thinking about this. The, it's raised interest rates. It's had its impact on interest rates because it's impact on inflation. It's impact on inflation because of energy costs and because of food costs. Uh, and obviously, I think that and the other inflationary impact is you know the, the printing of money during the pandemic. Now, all of these are transient effects. the The impact of the money printing will eventually fade through time. Uh, global energy supply chains will reorient, and you know that energy costs will and already have moderated food supply chains will also reorient and again i think india and china have surplus food production so a base effect also will come into play that's true and you know the the higher interest rates will eventually slow down you know the global economy i think we're all expecting a recession so the 
interest rates will then moderate as inflation will sort of moderate. It's it, there's no big long term impact. It it there's a, there's going to be huge humanitarian impact. I think five years from now we're going to be talking about this still, but uh, hopefully the economic impact on the rest of the world tends to sort of dissipate. Yeah, well. All I can see, we end on a positive note that India has won the Test match against Australia <laughs> in just three days. The mighty oh. Australians, who are I think uh, ranked the the the, the uh, ranked number one Test playing yeah. country, yeah, they lost. Well, that's that's a great note to end yeah. any podcast on. <laughs> India beating Australia is always a positive note. Absolutely. And uh, any man of the match for you, Ravindra Jadeja. He scored in the first innings and uh, also wickets both both innings as well for him. So he's back with uh, renewed energy and vigor, which is great news for the Indian cricket fans. Excellent, excellent. We need more all rounders in the team. You Absolutely. Know? Yes. So anyway, uh, great. I think this podcast uh, was really entertaining and enlightening for me. And uh, let's look, look up, up for new things, things to discuss, discuss uh, next week. Every few weeks. I'm sure yeah. the market will always produce some ugly for us to discuss next week. We, we live in interesting times. times. Yeah, we do, I guess.